Good evening. I'm the Maven of the Eventide. Welcome to Vampire Interviews. We are coming to you from Con Carolinas in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is a sci-fi fantasy writing convention. And I have a very special guest with me today who was a special guest at the convention. This is Faith Hunter, vampire author, not a vampire who is an author, but an author of vampire fiction. Here to that, share her opinion on vampires. That's a very important distinction. Thank you. People it's, always ask. Yes, you know, they if do. I say vampire author, they'll be like, "Wait, do you, and you know they know the answer, but they always ask." So you got to clarify. Yes. Well, I appreciate it. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. So you have written a lot of books. 40 something. Yeah, she yeah, just 40 something. <laughs> they aren't all vampire books, but many of them are. Right. Your um, long running vampire series, the Skinwalker series, yes. or the Jane Yellow Rock series, yes. starting with Skinwalker, the book of uh, features vampires, was that your first series to feature vampires? Yes. I had, I used Daywalkers in the, um, the Rogue Mage series, but they weren't traditional vampires. My editor at the time did not want traditional vampires. What time was that? This was, I uh, was probably writing that 2003. So that was and even a, before Vampire Burnout. Oh, yes. But now, Vampire Burnout happens all okay, the time. Okay, so that was the I last just, Vampire I, Burnout. Yeah, I, I, it was just happened to be one of those troughs in the vampire love world. So, um, yeah, she didn't want it, and I didn't argue. I made them daywalkers, and then I came up with this, and I had a different editor, and she said, okay. Which was so exciting. So tell, tell us the basic premise of this series, the Vampire series. Jane Yellowrock is a two-souled Cherokee skinwalker, a pre-white man skinwalker, so not an evil liver-eating skinwalker, but the kind that existed uh, in the most old Cherokee stories about skinwalkers, which were the ones who led the warriors into battle, the protectors of the tribe. The, they, were, they were important. They were good. They were. They tied a lot of the ancient stories together, and a lot of the um, the ancient people together. Jane became a skinwalker in the 1800s, just before the Trail of Tears. She was forced into her uh, uh, her first animal when she was five years old, and then through a lot of horrible things that happened, she ended up on the Trail of Tears with her grandmother. And to save her life, her grandmother forced her back into one of her forms and pushed her out into the snow to keep her away from the soldiers. Jane then ran into a cougar, like literally like bump, <laughs> and, oh dear, I'm eating your meal. And to save herself, she performed accidental black magic and she absorbed the soul of the mountain lion into herself. So Jane is literally two-souled. And then when we open the book Skinwalker. It is modern day time and she is on her way to New Orleans to take a gig by the master of the city to hunt down a rogue vampire who is killing vampires. And the master of the city is Leo Pellissier and he is a vampire himself. So it's the competent vampire is hunting down the rogue vampires and using the skinwalker character to do it. To do it, correct. And she's not a typical skinwalker because she has Beast's soul inside her. So she has two voices going on in her head all the time. So when you were wanting to write a vampire series and you weren't allowed to, so you wrote the Daywalkers, and then you finally got your chance to write your vampire series. Yes. And you incorporated skinwalkers into that. Did the vampires come first, or was it just sort of a happy combination? <laughs> The first line that came to me as I was allowing myself to think possibly vampires was Katie's Ladies, the oldest continually operating bordello in New Orleans. And That's Katie, one of the first lines in the books, too. Yes. And Katie is a vampire, about 400 years old. So Katie came before Jane? Yes. I thought I would have the main character be Katie. But then I realized that She's so old, the voice is going to be difficult for me to believe and for me to write well. She's and for also the French. To to you. Exactly. And she's French, and so there would be syntax changes. And there's now electronics that she would be having to deal with. And I realized that there were too many weaknesses there 
for me to do a good job making her likable. So immediately after that came Jane Doe. And I decided, well, I've discovered I'm part Native American, tribal American. And so I said, I don't know who the character's name is, so I'm just going to call her Jane Doe. And I'll make her Cherokee because I'm studying some of my history through the Cherokee stories. And suddenly Jane came to life with her own voice and her own strengths and her own weaknesses. I had a ball with her. The, the first book was not under contract when I first started. So I was able to spend the time not looking at deadlines and not trying to be um, ready at the moment to, to push through and concentrate on word count. I was able to develop this character. And my editor, who already loved it, was able to help me with some things. I had a little trouble with Beast's inner voice. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to sound too much like Cheetah. And Beast sounds very different from Jane's inner voice, Very different. Very different. And Beast, also, I needed Beast to be more primitive in language, but also in a position where Beast could grow as a character, too. So Beast has changed also. Um, Character development is a really important part of, of my writing technique. I always start with um, broken characters. I start with um, characters with uh, real problems and, and some weaknesses. And then as the book or the series, and in this case both, develop, I'm able to have that character grow. So when it comes to like a vampire character, yeah. who's, uh, vampires are so old or maybe set in their ways, maybe right. very unchangeable. How do you deal with having those kind of characters grow? They start out in the series as very stagnant characters. And they can't stay that way because they're not interesting. Mm-hmm. So Katie, who is the first vampire Jane meets, who is not insane, because Jane's always hunted for rogue vampires. That's the crazy ones that are killing people. She meets Katie, and it's her first sane vampire. Katie has no idea how to handle any kind of electronics. She has an old-fashioned, one of those big, heavy, black plastic, big, bulbous phones that she uses. and She, she doesn't understands even know how to, how to send not, a phone call, right? Does not know how to use anything electronic. But Katie gets into a lot of trouble and ends up in a healing process that sets my vampires, I think, very far apart from other vampires called a gather. And that's when she's put into a coffin, and this is where the coffin idea comes from in my vampire world. She's put into a coffin with the donated blood of all the vampires in the city. So they each slit their wrist and little, little bit go into the coffin. And that heals them when they're badly, badly wounded. If they're going to be healed, that's usually what it takes. But when Katie came back, she was wicked strong and wicked fast, and her brain was working, and she was able to click on how electronics worked, and all the things that she hadn't been able to do before suddenly began to come easily to her. So So that was fun. Something that was part of the vampire culture that you created led to her character growth. Yes, yes. And then in Leo's case, Leo was a misogynist. He believed he had a right to any female who walked his way because that was the world he grew up in. When did he grow up? He grew up 500 years ago. So he's a little bit older than Katie, you know, only 100 years. Um, So he grew up in uh, France and Spain. And by grow up, it's not just his very early years, but his early years as a vampire, too. He came to this country um, in the 1700s. So he was there for a long time in that part of the world, in in Europe, um, living and and growing and, and fitting into the European vampires, which are very different from the American vampires. Leo came to this country, and he established it, but he brought all of those old ways of thinking. Jane walks into his life, and he he tells her what she wants, and she says no. And he's never been told no. As far as a conquest sort of situation? Yeah. And he expects her to act a certain way, and she deliberately doesn't. Is she immune to his charms in a way that a normal human might not be? Yes, because she is, because she has Beast and because she's a skinwalker, but mostly because she has Beast. Beast is this other spirit, and Beast is a predator. So Beast recognizes a predator mm-hmm. and is not about to let Jane become prey, because if Jane becomes prey, Beast becomes prey. So Beast sort of steps in and encourages Jane to be outrageous, to be the unexpected to Leo. 
and that the the in, the first few encounters with all of these characters were so much fun because that's where you get your real story building from is what happens within the characters. I have my plot lines all lined out and what I'm going to do in terms of this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But what I don't outline is what happens when the characters meet in this internal sort of eye-to-eye relationship that they have. So when they meet, that's the suddenly creative part to me. And that's the most fun writing because I don't know what's going to happen. So when you were passionate about the idea of writing vampires, you wanted to do it. What was it that drove you to really want that? What was it about vampires that spoke to you that made you want to defy all the advice, all the trends, and say, no, I just really do want to write them? I started out in the mystery field, writing police procedurals with a co-writer, because that was really what was selling at the time. And I also had an interest in police procedurals. I liked watching cop shows on TV. Of course, back they were very different from what they are now. But I thoroughly enjoyed watching the good guy and the bad guy and the protocol and the police procedures and all that kind of stuff. So I wrote with this this police officer, and we reached the end of our career at when um, Rodney King was attacked by police officers, officers and entire lines disappeared. So then I thought, well, I want to do vampires because I had long been in love with Anne Rice. I mean, long. When I first read Interview with Lestat, I was in my 20s. I found one. It was in a paperback, the original tiny little mass market paperback. I had a... I have one of those. You had one? Yeah. I had a first edition that's long gone. But I read it and read it over and over and over. So probably one of the three books I've ever read more than once in my life. And I read it repeatedly, and I wanted to write that. And so I told my agent, I said, I want to write that. He said, nobody's buying that. You need to write what you are writing now. This is, I can get you in the door. Send me things that that I can sell. This was in the 2000s? And this was in 1992. Oh, goodness. (laughs) Because The Vampire Lestat came out in 1984? Yes. So So I had been, but see, I had been trying to get published all those years. Yeah. But what sold was was the police procedural. Sure. And there was no such thing as self-publishing back then where you could make any money. There just simply was not. There was no way to reach an audience. So it was New York or nothing. And so I did what I was told. I went back and I I wrote the things that uh, he could sell. And I made it big. I did really well writing women's thrillers for a long time. But I still wanted to get back. When you finally had that chance to let out your inner Anne Rice, as it were, to to do your take on vampires, was there anything that you set out that you wanted to do different than what you'd seen before, or was it more about honoring what you loved already? I didn't want my vampires to be broody. Mm. I I, I mean, really, being old and bored is one thing, but being old and whiny is another and I had come to realize that Lestat's pretty whiny. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's he's really got that whine thing down. The only time he's not whiny is when he's with someone who's whinier than he yes. is. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so I didn't want my characters to be that. I wanted them to be powerful beings. And powerful in the sense of knowing who they are and being strong in themselves and being strong in their vampire hier- hierarchy. But I also wanted my origination story to be very, very different. So... The second book in the series, which is Blood Cross, is all about the origination story. And I introduce it in that novel. And then I'm still writing it. I'm getting, I'm getting, I just, I just finished book 13. It comes out in November at Shattered Bonds. And I'm still bringing that original story, that original origination story that I introduce, I'm still bringing out new little bits and pieces of it and how it affects the vampires. So it has been a ball with that origination story. I've used a lot of interesting things about it. Do you have an end in mind, or are you just going to keep going as long as you have ideas? At this point, I have book 14 vaguely mapped out in my head. I know it's going to go from point A with a whole lot of other spots in between to point Z, and I know what the beginning and the end are. I don't have it planned out in the middle, but I kind so of have some Are you ideas. saving that end for when your agents and heirs are like, come on, Faith, time to wrap it up, and then you're like, okay, now I'm going to do the end? Or you- No, at the end of book 14, I will know who Jane is again. Jane has been reimagined and reborn in the sense of gaining new strengths and losing others all through the series. 
So I don't know that I've got another story to tell after this next book. I've reached the point in the series where I'm not going to know about the next book until I finish this one. So when I finish book 14, I may or may not have a book 15. I really don't know. We'll see. My editor wants more. They say that when you set out to write a book, especially a first in a series, you're not supposed to think about themes or what things mean. You just write, you let it out, and those things emerge organically. But after 13, almost 14 books, you probably have a good idea of what those themes turned out to be. What would you say? Family. How do the Um, vampires relate to them? To family? To whatever the themes of the books are, where do the vampires fit into that? The vampires are the anti-hero. They are equally good and equally evil. And they have um, the ability to mesmerize and cajole and convince. But they also are predators. They need humans to be subjective to them so, so that they can feed. In my world, metaphorically speaking, the vampires are the opposite of family. They are instead hierarchy. There's like political, governmental sort of like hierarchy? subjugation. Okay. So Jane, during the course of this series, builds real family, real people that she pulls into her sphere, like a, and she a found builds a, yeah a truly found family of with love and respect and equality, and the vampires present the opposite of that, which is, I own you, and therefore you will do what I say. So they have. They, they each have strengths and weaknesses. I'm not saying that the vampires are totally evil. They're, that's not the point. They're really not totally evil. They do a lot of good. My vampires will go into hospitals and save people who've been injured. They will offer their blood to people who are dying of cancer and, and, and help give them long enough life for chemo to work. So they do a lot of good with their bloodthirstiness, but they are still predators. Is their inability to have that true kind of family like Jane has part of their vampire nature? Is that something that happens when you become a vampire, you lose that ability? I think that it's a matter of time and you see so many of your humans die. Mm. And so you it's lose a matter of immortality. so much. Yeah, you lose so much. I, I remember when uh, my first classmate from high school died of cancer. And I remember thinking, what if I lived as long as my vampires? Everyone I know and love would be gone. And so, of course, I would reach the point where I don't think of family in the same terms. I would think of family as in what they can do for me and how they can serve me, not how I can serve them. And so family changes because you insulate yourself against grief and death and loneliness, because they've got to be terribly lonely. All they, all the only people who go with them over time are other vampires. So, vampires and skinwalkers. <laughs> are, are you the only one who does this? Were you the only one at the time? And people have done it since. Are, if you are the only one, why do you think that is? And why, why are you so lucky to have been the one to capture that? Patricia Briggs' character is a walker, okay. but not a skinwalker in the same sense that my character is. Her world has fae and fae uh, mythos and fae characters and vampires and werewolves and... Supernatural kitchen sink. Supernatural kitchen, yes, Yes. supernatural kitchen sink. My skinwalker can become any animal whose mass is the same as hers. It's very difficult for her to become a rat, for instance, Mm -hmm. because she has to throw off all of that mass and what if part of the mass that disappears is her brain? Then she's a rat forever. So I wanted to make sure that every animal that she changes into, that she shifts shape into, try to say that three times, <laughs> was of um, a particular mass to match so that they're all big. They're not little things that can sneak around and, and, and hide and, and, and spy, but that are predators. Do you think the skinwalker mythos and culture brings out anything in the vampire culture beyond the family concepts you already talked about? Anything in particular? I have a character who has disappeared that Jane never met in history. There is a 
painting on one of the home walls when she goes in to visit um, Gregoire's home. She sees this painting, and there's a yellow-eyed Cherokee woman in the painting. And she realizes, because yellow eyes are a sign of the, Cher- of the skinwalkers in the Cherokee, that that person must have been a skinwalker. And she asks, and what happened to her? What was her name? Her name was Canvista. And she died when she was in her late 70s. Jane can't find out how she died, doesn't have any idea, but she knows she's not the first. So, yes, there is something there. And you know what? Thank you. You might have just given me book 15. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) That would be a good story to write about because I have not, I've never played with that. That would be a good story. Do you think skinwalkers and vampires have anything in common as far as supernatural creatures go, or do you think they're very opposite and they're contrasting? Is there a Venn diagram? I think that they are, it's like two different species of humans. Um, The Neanderthals are still fit into the human Mm -hmm. spectrum. They are human, but they're not homo sapien sapien. Is that what we are now, I think? Homo sapien sapien? So they're different in that sense. Skinwalkers don't drink blood, don't use people. Do tend to go insane when they get old, but for very different reasons from what happens with the vampires. Are they immortal in the same way, like longer lived than normal They are longer lived than normal. Um, But I have decided, I have a, and and this is not in the book, so I may change my mind. (laughs) But I have, I have this sort of rule of thumb in, in the back of my head that says my skinwalkers grow older, grow no older than a thousand years. And after 500, they begin to lose sanity and start to be driven toward the liver eater part of the mythos, which mm-hmm. is um, liver eater, spear finger. Um, in the Cherokee mythos, this was um, the skinwalker that went insane and would eat the livers of children and hover over and kill dying people or steal their their uh, their life out of them. They were really so horrible. Hmm? There's a little bit of vampirism there's in that. There's a little bit of vampirism in that, but they're very different in the sense that there's no need for blood. There's no dependency required. They can be completely alone, and they do tend to be loners. The the skinwalkers that I have created in during the course of these 14 books and the four... Uh, Soulwood books, which is sort of a crossover series. And some of my vampires appear in that one, too. Well, these skinwalkers um, being loners, yeah, Jane okay. finding family, yes. does that, um, she so, sort of transcended the skinwalker curse, as it yes, were? Yes. She, Jane looks at vampires as competitors. Vampires don't look at her as a competitor because they don't see her as being a threat. Because they've been the top of the food chain for so long, and she looks human. And skinwalkers are so rare in your right. World they're so rare; they're they don't really know anything about them. So the fact that Jane comes along and rips all of their concepts to shreds and becomes necessary to their survival, and becomes a part of Leo's Leo Pelissier's end game if he loses. If he loses power, he wants Jane in place. And in the entire series takes you through Leo trying to bemuse Jane, to pull her in under his sway, under his spell, because he has a purpose for her, but he cannot bind her because of Beast, because she's a skinwalker. So he has to find other ways to do it. And oh, is he sneaky? He's so sneaky. Leo is dreadfully sneaky. And he's almost 500. Yes. Do vampires have the problem of the older you get, the more likely you are to go insane, similar to skinwalkers, or no. do they not? So would you say that the skinwalker being more connected to an animal yes. versus vampire more of a very clinical human, yes. that sort of humanity that's so separate from that Yeah, nurturing. sociopathic almost mm-hmm. with So the he's vampires. sort of got like two kinds of ends of a spectrum here yeah. if you're looking at these creatures as representative of humanity. Yes, absolutely. They are... They are very, very different. They have a few things that overlap, but the things that are similar are different enough that they don't look at one another as equal. Mm -hmm. They they don't see one another as equally powerful or of of, of any value, really, to life. 
And I'm sure they each think that their own way of life is the better one. Oh, yes, absolutely. Do you put forth as the author's voice an opinion on which is better, or is it more just this exists, see where you fall on the spectrum? My vampires and my skinwalkers end up working together because there's a greater enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm. And when Jane becomes aware that her witch friends are going to be killed by this attacker who is coming into the country, and that this attacker will destroy all of life as she understands it, and that to prevent that, the military will probably bomb the heck out of whatever city he lands just to make sure they get him. He's that dangerous. Is he human? He is not. And so Jane makes a determination to stay with the vampires a little longer, and then a little longer, and then a little longer. And the readers who are paying attention to the reasoning, which is to protect Angie Baby, her godchild, this child of her heart that she adores, then it makes sense why she stays. So you also have witches in your book. Yes. And um, instead of it being a spectrum of vampires here, skinwalkers here, is it more of a triangle with witches representing something else about humanity, or are they sort of apart from that well, spectrum? Well, in, in my world, vampires are created beings. They did not simply diverge from humanity. They were created in an act of horrific black magic. So the vampires have a really horrible and I won't tell you what it is, origination story. Witches, however, are a genetic offspring, offshoot of humans. They can mate with humans and have human children or witch children. But the witch gene only travels through the X female chromosome. So 99% of all witches are female. Just like in the real world. Just like in the real world. (laughs) Um... Skinwalkers, on the other hand, are also can also mate with humans and have perfectly normal human children or can have skinwalker children. So they are part of humanity, but an offshoot of humanity that can still breed in. Metaphorically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> you like the metaphors. I, the I metaphors. know. Do, do the witches represent something in particular to your mind? Yeah, women. Okay. Women who get called names because we don't do what we're told. Or we don't act as we're supposed to act, or we don't act ladylike, or we don't act sexual enough. I mean, there's always people out there who want us to be other from ourselves. And so the witches are women. They're always, they're always at risk of being burned at the stake through history, having their goods confiscated. They are the bound ones because they have children, and those children are witches. And if they're in captivity, then they can't do anything to protect themselves. So would the vampire hierarchy on the other end be more of a patriarchal sort of representation? Probably. Although, well, yes, actually, definitely, because the the origination story is based upon two male two males who did this this horrible act of black magic, and that act of black magic created the first vampires. It's very patriarchal in the sense of ownership. They don't think in terms of family like my witches do. They think in terms of ownership. Mm-hmm. And when they were created was 2,000 years ago, when in the Middle East, when slavery was a very common thing. So holding humans as slaves did not bother them. So it, you, there are plenty of female vampires, but they're still supporting this patriarchal yes. community. But even in that sense, the sane vampires who are part of this hierarchy aren't the worst ones. There's also the rogue vampires, the ones yes. that lose their mind and are and killing then humans. And then there's the European vampires. So there's two kinds of vampires. There's the, um, the naturaleza, and those like chasing down humans and draining them and killing them, and it's the hunt. And the others are the Mithrans, and they are the ones who practice uh, fame vexatum, which is um, starving to death. That's what it means, is not killing their humans. They drink a little, and they put the human aside, and then when they're hungry again, they drink a little from someone else. And their humans are their slaves as opposed to just their prey. So the Americans are where all of the family vexatum came. 
the Mithrans who practice this. The slaveholders. No, the Mithrans who practice not holding slaves okay. came to America. The Naturaleza are in Europe, and they're the ones who are coming. They're the bad guys. So bad vampires versus slightly less bad vampires yes. versus murderous, mentally unhinged mentally vampires. Mentally unhinged vampires. Um, they haven't cured. Like you hang a piece of pork in the smokehouse to cure. Um, my vampires have a 10-year period of insanity minimum after they are bitten. So it's not, it's not an easy thing to become a vampire. It's very difficult and it's very possible that you may be you may never retain regain sanity. So being turned is not something that everybody wants. It's a good way to explain why everyone doesn't just yes. go off and become a vampire because right. being a vampire is it so awesome. It sounds <laughs> wonderful, doesn't it? But it's really really hard. And when they come out of this curing process, this devovio, they have to then learn this restraint, the fame vexatum and control everything about themselves so they don't kill humans because it's not allowed by the Mithrans. So aside from Anne Rice, do you have any other favorite vampire media or favorite vampire characters? When I was younger, there was this horrible movie, early film, called The Nosferatu. Do you know the one I'm talking about? It's a black and white. The, the guy with the Latin. German? Yeah, the German one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I love that guy. He is so horrible, and he's so funny. And I know it, it was never intended to be amusing. I know it was supposed to be horrific to well, people you know, at the back time. Then, but suppose, but yes, you watch but it now. One of my best friends showed me that years ago, and we just cackled and had a wonderful time with him. So I think he's great, just because he's different from modern day vampires or our perception of vampires as they exist at this point. And who else? I still like Lestat. <laughs> He's my favorite. I mean, he is whiny. He is the whiniest person, and you just want to slap him sometimes. But he has this poetic intensity to him that I really like. You were and talking still, before about him being just a strong character. Yes. He is the kind of character who was able to walk away from others like him and the world that they insisted he be a part of. And that's what I admired about his character so much is he wasn't just one of them he was his own man and he could get on a boat and go somewhere else and I admired that about him I admired him coming to the Americas and I admired I, I, I admired him building a family although he went about it a pretty horrible way in some cases um, and 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 I, I admired how he dealt with the old ones of his species Vampires have been done so many different ways. Yeah. There's so much that you've done them your way, which is pretty fresh and unique and original. Yes. Um, you've been doing that for about a decade now, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any thoughts on what you would like to see for the future of vampires, for the next generation of vampires? Is there something you think that needs to be done or done again or done better, perhaps? I would like to see the. <laughs> this is going to sound really stupid, but I would like to see a vampire who is a successful businessman mm -hmm. or politician. The, the mythos then would, he, would be he didn't have the sun allergy. He would be able to go out into the sun. But I would like to see what one of those would be like. Would he be doing this, keeping his vampire nature secret, or would he be open about it? I haven't gone that far. I just would like to see a vampire making it in the business world with all of his accumulated wisdom and knowledge and probably money yeah. and um, and sort of being a, a bon vivant man about town but with this heavy bloody baggage I don't think that I've seen carries. that done where a vampire is open and still yes. successful accepted enough in some yeah. ways to be that successful they're would, always secretive or yeah. mafia style yeah. or something I would like to have just this open, even if the world at large doesn't know he's a vampire, mm -hmm. he doesn't hide it, and he uses his compulsion talents, his mesmeric talents, to get what he wants in business and relationships. And I think that would be fun. I would like to see somebody do that. I, I'm not the one to do it, but I'll bet somebody could do it. It might end up being a good comedy, but um, I think it would be fun. I'm going to ask you the hard question again. What would that metaphorically represent? Uh, 
Um, the sociopathic normality among us. Oh, yeah. That is so true. I can do that one because I'm not writing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have a harder time with my own vampires of course. and what they represent because there's so many of them. And they, there are this, there's this supposedly pro-human group and there's this obviously prey, predator relationship group that is predominantly in Europe and is coming here. It's like the Civil War. It's like, it's like not admitting that there's slavery. And it's like it's, it's not, not about slaves. It's about you know land, m- money, right. land. That's all. And it was about all of those things, but it was predominantly about a lifestyle driven by slavery. Yeah. They, anybody who says it was about this or this or this and they say it wasn't about slaves, you say, yes, but that related to slavery and that related to slavery and that related to slavery and that related to slavery. So guess what? Here's slavery. Here's your excuses. You can do any of them without it. Right. I think of them as brother against brother, and it's not as cut and dried as, as other creatures. Like with Jane, she's... She's the builder, the protector. That's what she. That's what skinwalkers were. They pretend, They were the protectors of their tribe. The superheroes. The superheroes, and that is what she is. But she doesn't have a tribe anymore. So she has to build a family, and out of family comes growth and strength and wisdom, and power, and sacrifice. So. The metaphors have been stretched at this point in heading into book 14 so strongly that they don't entirely hold true, but they're still there if you tear them apart. Those metaphors are still there. The first Skinwalker book came out in 2009, right? Nine or six? Nine. Oh, July the 7th. July the 7th, 2009. I came so impressed with myself (laughs) because it's 10 years this year. Congratulations. Yes, I'm very excited. So, so that yes, was a vampire peak in as far as popularity goes. Yes. And then the lull happened and you were still writing it. Yes. And How then did that go for you? The success of Stephanie Meyer's books mm-hmm. brought vampires back again. And that carried for a very long time. Now, New York is not really buying new vampire series. But you were grandfathered in. I was grandfathered in. Did you in. see any loss of readership? Did you see any people saying they were sick of them when it came to you, or no. were you you were golden? I was already far enough into the series that I had hooked the readers on the origination story and the relationship between Jane and all of the people, including the vampires around her, and her weaknesses and her strengths had drawn people in, and so they've stayed with me. And every succeeding book that has come out First week sales are better than the previous one, which is fairly unheard of. Congratulations. And, That's impressive. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it's fairly unheard of. And I know, I will know that the readership is dropping off when that stops happening. And I will do something else when the readership isn't there. Well, I hear vampires are starting to come back again, yeah. so you may get another one. <laughs> really? List. Yeah, I've seen agents on Twitter, because, you know, I follow book Twitter, yeah. saying, you know, I, I, I feel weird about admitting this, but I kind of want you to send me some vampire fiction. So, who knows? Vampires are seductive and urbane and compelling, and they are all of the good things about Hannibal Lecter without having to necessarily kill their dinners before they eat them. So you get Could they have their dinner and eat it too? Yes, they can. (laughs) And so it can be something that is a recurring fascination with our culture. And frankly, there have been so many superheroes and everything was sort of gearing toward Marvel and, and that sort of thing in the film industry. And they've gone through all of them. Really, and and now they're trying to find new stuff and or old stuff that mm-hmm. hasn't been published in a long time, and the readership is there looking for something bigger and better. Vampires. Is there anyone writing vampires lately or lesser known that you would recommend that you happen to like that you can think of? I love um, Patty Patricia Briggs. 
I love her series. She's not lesser known. She's way bigger than I am. (laughs) But I love her vampires because they have this sort of sociopathic um, control that uh, over their humans that resonates with me. And they also have, of course, the vampire who, Stefan, who likes people and likes the main character. So I love that series. She's way better known than I am. I'm plugging her anyway. Um, but really not, not anybody else that I can think of off the top of my head who's still doing vampires. Maybe, maybe soon. Maybe soon. And I've heard that Kim Harrison is going back to her Hollow series. Mm-hmm. Yes, back to picking up with her two original main characters and moving forward. So um, assuming that is true, Kim, is it true? Um, I expect to see more vampires. So you write things other than vampires. You have other series. Um, What's coming up next for you that people can look out for besides the next book in the Skinwalker series? The fourth book in the Soulwood series, which is an offshoot of this, but more like a paranormal police procedural with um, earth magic being at the core of the main character's power, uh, paranormal ability. That, the fourth one, I am all, the fourth one just came out, and the fifth one I'm almost finished with. I have like 30 more pages to go in it, and then I'll be able to put it aside for a couple of weeks and then come back and do my rewrites. And that's a very long, involved process when you work with New York. So for a year, I'll be working on that more. And then Shattered Bonds, which is book 13 in the Jane Yellow Rock series, will be out in November. There will be a special promotion of the Jane Yellow Rock series in July for our 10-year anniversary of the release of Skinwalker. So that offshoot series, does it have vampires in it? Or yes, is- oh, there okay. are vampires in it. And some were introduced in the Jane Yellow Rock series. Uh, Lincoln Shattuck and some of the others are there in Knoxville where this series is set, where Soulwood series is set. And some are new, like Yummy, who I think is Yummy. I adore <laughs> her, and she's a vampire. And there's a whole short story where Yummy becomes her nickname. I won't tell you what it is, but it was so much fun writing. And then I have a new shiny that I can't announce yet, but um, contract negotiations are taking place. It's probably going to be a series of three novellas, maybe. That's what we're aiming toward. And the first one is finished and ready to begin the editorial process. Uh, But I can't say anything. I can't say say anything about it. Can you say if it has vampires? It will not have vampires. Okay. It will not have vampires. So it will not make you happy, except... Everything you do makes me happy. uh, (laughs) Except it has cats in it. Ooh, I like cats. Really, really different cats. Totally different from any cat you've seen in fiction before. I'm intrigued. Mm. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry we couldn't be in my usual lair. Uh, We've got our skull... Shawl. But I love the skull shawl. And in case you guys didn't get to see it, looky, isn't that cool? Little dancing skull. (laughs) I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Good night. Bye.